30. This is being 30. Go ahead. Beam is ready. Pull your beam plug. Berkeley, California. High on a hill across the bay from San Francisco sits a round building the size of an airplane hangar. Inside the building is a huge machine that for 39 years has created conditions that exist not on this earth, but in the hearts of distant stars. These are the final experiments for the oldest of the giant atom smashers. Around and around again, the immense machine accelerates a beam of invisible atomic particles. Faster and faster and faster they go until they approach the speed of light. In a silent explosion, they smash open with their target. In that moment, the gigantic accelerator reveals to us minute traces of the matter and energy that we are. Nature is kind of a, of a never-ending mystery, and you find out what you can with uh, a certain accelerator, then you find there are particles or there are configurations of particles and you can't understand it. Uh, so you get, you make an accelerator of higher energy. And what does that do? That, uh, generally speaking, uh, smashes the fragments of the atom or the parts of the atom into still smaller pieces. A great deal is known about uh, the constituents of an atom, but there are some uh, mysteries that seem to be deeper than ever. And uh, the only tool one really has to get at them uh, is uh, smashing the fragments and then studying the fragments by uh, ever more subtle and sophisticated means. The Bevatron is a descendant of the cyclotron, an instrument invented by Ernest Orlando Lawrence, who won the 1939 Nobel Prize in Physics for his invention. Lawrence started what was then called the Radiation Laboratory in an engineering building at the University of California at Berkeley. In the 1940s, the laboratory began its move up into the hills above the campus. Later, it was renamed the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Several accelerators were built between the first handheld cyclotron that won the Nobel Prize for Lawrence and the much larger Bevatron, which measured more than 100 feet across. The idea was to make bigger and bigger machines so that particles would collide at higher energies and fracture into smaller and smaller bits of matter. Engineer William Brobeck came to work for Ernest Lawrence in 1937. It was kind of fun. Everybody was very enthusiastic as a result. The physics that was coming out was so interesting and so much interest to other people around the country. There was a constant flow of visitors through the laboratory finding out how to make their own cyclotron. <laughs> I guess there were probably half a dozen cyclotrons or maybe twice that many built at that around the world, copies of uh, rough copies of the ones at Berkeley. That was the only source of information. After World War II, Edwin McMillan, a physicist at the laboratory, discovered the phase stability principle. This concept opened the door to a new type of accelerator called a synchrotron. Bill Brobeck began making drawings for a new machine, which he dubbed the Bevatron. BEV for billion electron volts, because the new machine was designed to push particles so fast their energy could increase to billions of electron volts. Construction began in 1949. The Bevatron's first beam at its full energy of six billion electron volts was delivered on April Fool's Day, 1954. About a year later, Owen Chamberlain and Emilio Segre discovered the antiproton at the Bevatron. They were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. 
the Bevatron was really the first of the accelerators that had enough energy that one hoped to, we could, one could see the production of antiprotons. They had been looked for and not found in, in, uh, in many cosmic ray experiments. So one had the feeling finally <laughs> uh, we, 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 we saw it, and that's good. The Bevatron is a particle accelerator. It basically consists of a circular racetrack with particles speeding around it. The particle source is usually an element such as gold or argon in the form of a solid or a gas. The atoms of the source element are bombarded by electrons in an arc which strip their electrons away, leaving only the nuclei. When the nuclei are sufficiently energized, an injector feeds them into the Bevatron's racetrack, an evacuated tube which runs in a circle inside a huge four-part magnet. Each time they make a complete circle, the particles get a jolt from an accelerating electrode, which pushes them to higher and higher speeds until they approach the speed of light. To get to high energies, particles circulate millions of times and travel hundreds of thousands of miles in a matter of a second or two. The magnetic guide field is generated by a gigantic motor generator. As the particles accelerate, the magnetic field is increased to keep them from shooting out of their orbit. When the particles are going fast enough, Two plunging magnets called mice knock them out of their orbit, extracting them from the magnetic ring. The beam of particles rushes through a pipe into an experimental area. The speeding nuclei are hurled against a stationary target, usually a thin strip of metal. The fragments of matter from the explosion rush forward into an array of detectors that provide scientists with data for their experiments. They use various media, gases, for example, or photographic emulsions, to show the tracks of the invisible particles. The detectors we use here must be sensitive to the products that are invisible, extremely tiny, and moving almost with the speed of light. We have several types of detectors for that. One detects the heat that the particle gives off, as in the bubble chamber and streamer chambers. Another type detects the electrical charge of the particle, uh, such as a Geiger counter. A third type detects the light given off as a particle passes through a special piece of plastic. That light is then converted to an electrical charge. One very famous detector was the hydrogen bubble chamber built by Louis Alvarez and his group. Alvarez was awarded the 1968 Nobel Prize for the discoveries made with the bubble chamber. Bubble chamber is an extremely simple idea. You take any liquid, many liquids, uh, put them in a, under pressure in a supersaturated state where they want to boil but can't quite try to figure out where to start boiling. Uh, suddenly release the pressure and shoot a particle beam through them. The particle uh, ionizes, uh, has collisions with the liquid as it goes through and generates little trails of heat. Those heat immediately turn into tiny bubbles which grow and can be photographed. So uh, it's simply marvelous. You can see the incoming particle, you can see where it collides with a proton, you can see all the particles spewing off. Uh, it was just uh, it was just unbelievable. There were many particles discovered when the bubble chamber was built. Uh, Louis Alvarez and co-workers built a bubble chamber and uh, they discovered a whole set of new particles. Uh, these were called resonances. These were particles which lived for a very short time but in the bubble chamber one was able to uh, deduce their properties and measure their masses and so forth. So there were of the order of uh, 50 new particles discovered, uh, all of them uh, from the Bevaton, and that really helped enormously uh, in, in understanding particle physics. Physicists from around the world came to the Bevatron to study the fundamental interactions of matter. 
but by the early 1970s, the Bevatron was slated to be turned off. What happened was that after um, a fairly short time of use, a few decades, the Bevatron was no longer really useful for those kind of studies because much more powerful accelerators had been built to go to higher energies. Normally, the uh, useful lifetime of uh, an accelerator is just a decade or so because there's constantly advances. So um, this, everyone felt that the Bevatron had served its purpose and it was time to decommission and retire it. But then someone uh, very cleverly thought of a new way to give it a new lease on life. And that was the birth of the Bevelac. The idea was to use a, a linear accelerator at LBL called the Hilac, the Super Hilac, start the acceleration there, get it going to a certain energy, then just drop the particles through a transfer line into the old Bevatron. This was uh, no small feat. It was done, could have, could have been done in many ways, we know now, but at that time we had to live with a rather small budget. So what was ha done is that a lot of uh, previously built magnets and quadrupoles and everything were put together into something which, which would uh, do the job. Initially, the only particles accelerated in the Bevatron were protons derived from hydrogen gas. Hydrogen contains only one proton in its nucleus. When the electron is knocked away, the hydrogen atom is called simply a proton. With the addition of the super hylac and an upgrade of the cryogenic vacuum, the Bevatron was able to circulate heavy ions. These are charged particles from elements heavier than hydrogen. The Bevatron was the first machine in the world capable of accelerating heavy nuclei like uranium close to the speed of light. And it was the only machine that could accelerate all of the elements from hydrogen to uranium. Scientists used the heavy ion beam to treat cancer patients. Ernest Lawrence had a brother, John, who was a physician. He joined the laboratory in the 1930s and was the first to perform irradiations of patients with tumors. In the 50s, John Lawrence and Cornelius Tobias used charged particles to study the irradiation of pituitary diseases. Then, from the 1970s until the early 1990s, medical researchers conducted a clinical study in which they treated more than 1,300 cancer patients with the Bevatron's heavy ion beam. They discovered that for certain tumors, the particle beam worked better than standard radiation treatments. Well, there are two real advantages for, for this kind of radiation first of which is that since it's a charged particle, it can be much more precisely delivered than the standard kinds of high-energy x-ray treatment that you would commonly find in a hospital. And that precise delivery means uh, a greater effect on the tumor and less side effects in terms of normal tissues around the tumor. If you were an x-ray machine and I stand close to you, the closer I get to you, the tissues of my body that are the closest get the highest dose. And the farther I step away, the dose drops off. The particle beams are very different. Instead of this kind of drop off in dose with distance, what you can do is actually have a particle dose delivered that's higher at depth than it is at the entrance. The other big advantage is the biology of these particles, that is the biological effects, are greater and therefore there's a better chance of killing tumor cells with the Bevatron radiation than with the standard kinds of radiation. So the patient would typically be seated in, in this chair and in a mask and the radiation beam um, came from the um, Bevatron where it was accelerated into this room in a horizontal fashion and would pass through a number of devices to shape the beam to determine how deeply it would penetrate and then through these uh, measuring devices to be sure that we had exactly the right dose and energy and finally intersect uh, the patient coming to rest in the tumor. From running neon or helium beams for medical therapy one day, 
the Bevatron could be switched to gold or uranium ions for a nuclear physics experiment that same night. It ran night and day. When I first came here in the early 60s, uh, the Bevatron was the centerpiece of the laboratory. And that meant that almost all the engineering efforts, uh, the shop facilities, were uh, in support of that program. In fact, this very building that we're in was put up by the Hunter Geophysics community for supporting the Bevatron program. This was a big machine with lots and lots of pieces, and all of them were complicated. And so it was almost, it felt almost organic to me because there were so many parts to it that it was almost like an animal. Anything could break down at any time. Um, you knew that there were things that were doing well and things that weren't doing well, and there was a constant army of people who were keeping track of everything, maintaining it, and uh, who knew the system. I think that we had uh, one of the best groups of people around the country. It's kind of a variety. I mean, I've got electronics people, I've got mechanical people, I've got water people, I've got vacuum people, uh, draftsmen and engineers all go together in the same project. Operators tuned the beam to keep it coming for the experimenters. Well, when, when you learn how to tune a machine like the Bevatron or, or the Highway, you actually uh, can feel a machine. Uh, it sounds strange. It's a it's a piece of iron, but but you can actually feel it. You can uh, when you when you're tuning it, you can listen to it. You can actually. Uh, when I was working here at the Bevatron, I could hear, I could tell you with my eyes closed if this beam, if the beam was on or off, and you could feel it. And and when you're tuning it, you actually. Uh, become part of the machine. Only inside the Bevatron and inside a handful of other accelerators around the world do we find the extremes of temperature and pressure that accompanied the Big Bang, that moment in time that many physicists think was the origin of our universe. The uh, grandfather of all accelerators are the supernovae, that is the massive stars, uh, many times the mass of the sun, that blow up in extremely violent uh, explosions. Uh, they give off in a day or so uh, much more energy than our sun gives off in its entire uh, many billion year life. And uh, the, it spews out particles of all kinds into space, and uh, some of those are detectable here on Earth. We call them cosmic rays. Earth has a magnetic field which shields us from the cosmic rays coming into the Earth and protecting us. So the Earth's magnetic field shields us. But if you go beyond the Earth's magnetic field, then there's no shielding, no protection from getting hit by these heavy ions from the cosmic rays. So in order to mimic those kind of cosmic ray situation in the upper cosmos, onto the ground level studies, Bevatron was the ideal machine. Scientists at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory did space studies for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration for many years at the Bevatron. In an early experiment, the scientists voluntarily looked into the Bevatron's beam to see what was keeping the astronauts awake. They were trying to sleep but they were seeing these light flashes like tadpoles, and Dr. Tobias and Dr. Tom Berninger felt that these astronauts, while they're trying to sleep in their cabin, are seeing heavy ions going through their eyes mm, and creating what we call the light flashes. All right? So how do we know that? So we mimicked that in the Bevatron. We were all first put, taken to a room for three, two, three hours so that we get you know, accustomed to the darkness in the room. And then we were taken to the Bevatron, and in a very controlled way, they put the Bevatron beam into my left eye, for example, and I saw the light flashes just like the astronauts did. Right up to the time the Bevelac was closed for lack of funding in 1993, scientists continued to improve the machine. 
Most accelerators just run for a few years and then they're shut down as a new one comes online, but the Bevatron has run much longer than any other accelerator. And the reason for it is that it was constantly upgraded and updated. In spite of improvements and ongoing programs, the machine was finally retired. This accelerator is the place where this whole idea of relativistic heavy ion physics was born. There is now no place in the world where anybody is doing therapy, cancer treatment, radiotherapy, with heavy ions. That was done here at the Babalak, and that will be done in Japan in the future. The accelerator is under construction there. As far as the nuclear physics goes, the Bevelac, the Hel Relativistic Heavy Ion Program, has given birth to essentially a new accelerator that will be located at Brookhaven called the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, where the nuclear physicists will be able to go up to even higher energies than they could at the Bevelac. And this type of physics that was done here will continue at a laboratory in Germany called GSI, where they have made a more modern version of the Bevelac. On February 20th, 1993, the Bevatron's beam was turned off. Scientists, engineers, and technicians gathered to say goodbye to a machine that had brought almost 40 years of exceptional scientific progress. Ed Lofgren's going to turn off the machine. 39 years to the week after the uh, first beam was circulated. This is going to be easier than turning it on. <laughs> it took about three months. Uh, are you going to tell me go or do I just do it? No, stop. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> go. Oh. Oh. 